section twenty four of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter twenty four castle street long acre to the north of long acre runs castle street for many years notorious as a nest of thieves prostitutes and juvenile vagabonds of the most degraded description at the period of which we are writing a person of the name of thompson owned and probably still possesses the lodging-houses numbered twenty three twenty four and twenty five in castle street this individual resided in mint street borough where he had similar houses in addition to others in buckeridge street st giles's the houses in buckeridge street would make up one hundred beds and those in castle street sixty at lodging-houses of this description the rooms are filled with low truckle beds each having a straw mattress two coarse sheets a blanket and a rug the price of half a bed is threepence and it need scarcely be observed that men women and children sleep together in these filthy receptacles without the slightest regard to decency or modesty sometimes when the lodging-houses are particularly crowded three persons will share one bed or motives of economy frequently compel a poor family thus to herd together it is by no means an uncommon occurrence for a grown-up girl to sleep with her father and mother or with her brothers a poor married couple will even share their bed with a male friend and no shame is known who can define where the shades of doubtful honesty and confirmed roguery meet and blend in these low lodging-houses the labouring man is in nightly company with the habitual thief his wife and his as yet uncorrupted daughter are forced to associate with the lowest prostitutes how long will that wife remain faithful that daughter taintless the very children who breathe that infected atmosphere soon become lost and triumph in their degradation the principal frequenters and patrons of these low lodging-houses are regular customers and consist of thieves prostitutes beggars coiners burglars and hawkers the casual lodgers are labouring men and their families whom poverty compels to sleep in such horrible places the hawkers make a great deal of money they can buy steel pens for nine pence a gross pocket-books for three pence each snuff-boxes for six pence each and pen-knives for four and a half pence each on every article they can gain one hundred per cent many of these hawkers consider nine or ten shillings to be only a reasonable and by no means a good day's work some of the women who frequent the lodging-houses in castle street and elsewhere and who have no children of their own hire infants for fourpence or sixpence a day and obtain in the shape of alms at least four or five shillings a day each females of this class care not whether their husbands or lovers work or remain idle for they boast that they can keep them and keep them well too some of these women knit caps in the streets and they make more money than those who merely trust to the children accompanying them as the motive of charitable persons compassion in the low lodging-houses of castle street and wherever else they may be found the most frightful dissipation as well as the most appalling immorality prevails drunkenness is the presiding genius of these dens and how much has strong drink to answer for it is strong drink that helps to fill the jails the hulks the asylums for the wretched and the diseased and the insane 
it is strong drink that calls forth so many sighs and such bitter tears shortens existence perpetuates family disease and fosters maladies of all species and of all kinds strong drink often places the criminal in the condemned cell and reduces the beautiful girl to barter her charms for bread strong drink strews the land with old rags and bleaching bones let temperance and moderation be the guides of all for what are the results of intemperance and habitual drunkenness behold them in all the poor and low neighbourhoods of london and if you ask reader by what signs you are to recognise them we will tell you by the leaden eyes the tottering steps the shaking limbs the haggard countenances the feverish brows the parched lips the dry and furred tongue the hot and pestilential breath and the tremulous voices of the confirmed votaries of strong drink apoplexy palsy delirium tremens enlarged liver ossified heart impaired digestion yellow jaundice cancerous stomach and dropsy all these attend upon strong drink and the hideous catalogue of evils includes also broken limbs fearful accidents and gushing wounds as well as many of those hereditary maladies which are handed down from father unto son in an earlier chapter we ridiculed the phrase of merry england oh is it merry to see so much misery so much crime so much oppression so much sorrow so much absence of sympathy if all this be joyous then of a surety is england the merriest country and london the merriest city on the face of the earth if a man can find music in the cries that issue from our crowded prisons and the wails that flow from our barbarous workhouses then may he dance long and heartily to that melody for it never ceases if poverty can excite felicitous sensations within him heaven knows he need never be sad if crime can bring smiles to his lips his countenance need never wear a melancholy aspect and if he can slake his thirst in the heart-wrung tears of human agony he need never step out of his way to look for a fountain or a spring in this light england is indeed merry for the observer of human nature as he walks through the crowded streets of london is jostled and hemmed in by all the gaunt and hideous forms that bear the denominations and wear the characteristics of crime poverty disease sorrow and despair old death knocked at the door of number twenty three castle street and was instantly admitted by a tall pale and rather handsome girl who exclaimed ah my fine fellow i thought you would come is it you mutton face said bones with a grim smile me and no one else answered the girl but walk in old death accepted the invitation and followed mutton face sal into a room where about two dozen persons male and female were crowded round a large fire one was a young man of the name of quinn and who obtained a handsome income by means of imposture he was accustomed to appear in the streets as a wretched-looking deplorable old man bent double with age and infirmity supporting himself on a stick and crawling along in a painful manner at the slowest possible rate he used to swallow a dose of some strong acid every morning to make himself look ghastly pale and he succeeded so well in counterfeiting an aspect of the most lamentable nature that he seldom returned to castle street at night with less than ten shillings in his pocket he had now thrown off his disguise and was whiling away the time after a good supper with a quart of egg hot next to him sat a young woman stout florid and rather good-looking she was in her stays and petticoat having very quietly taken off her gown to mend a rent and she experienced not the slightest shame at thus exposing all the upper part of her person to the mixed society present neither did they appear to think there was anything at all remarkable in her conduct 
how indeed could it be otherwise since she would presently undress herself entirely in that very room and before all her companions who would do the same male and female when the hour arrived to repair to the beds ranged along the wall this girl was known as jane cummins and was the mistress of the impostor quinn farther on was a fellow who was sitting upright enough in his chair then but who appeared daily in the streets as a bent cripple he was accustomed to go about imitating a cuckoo by which avocation he made a good living he invariably got drunk every night next to this impostor was a little deformity who was tied round the body to his chair he had no legs and was dragged about the streets of a day in a kind of cart drawn by two beautiful dogs and having a banner unfurled behind him the woman in charge of number twenty three paid him the greatest attention put him to bed at night helped him to rise in the morning carried him out to his vehicle strapped him in and saw him safe off on his excursion about the metropolis he usually returned at four to his dinner and did not go out afterwards his earnings were on the average ten shillings a day a woman of about thirty dressed in widow's weeds and far advanced in the family way sat next to the little deformity she had never been married but was possessed of five children who were now playing in one corner of the room she was accustomed to take her stand in some public thoroughfare with her children drawn up in a row and this game she had carried on at the time of which we are writing for four years rather a long period of widowhood she disliked fine weather because the hearts of the charitable are more easily touched by the spectacle of a destitute family standing in the midst of a pouring rain or on the snow and she reckoned that in bad weather she could earn eight or nine shillings a day every saturday night she took her station in some poor neighbourhood such as church street bethnal green leather lane lambeth marsh high street st giles's or clare market and on those occasions she often obtained as much as fifteen shillings but then as she very justly observed sunday was a day of rest and so it was indeed to her for she was in the habit of getting so awfully drunk every saturday night after her return home to castle street that she was compelled to lie in bed all the next day until three or four o'clock when she rose to a good dinner she always kept herself and children remarkably neat and clean not from any principle but as a matter of calculation charitable people thought she was a good mother and a deserving though distressed woman and alms poured in upon her when questioned by any individual who relieved her she would reply that her husband was a bricklayer who had fallen off a ladder and killed himself six weeks ago or that he was an honest hard-working man whose career was suddenly cut short by his being run over by a gentleman's carriage or some such tale next to her sat a young woman who was wont to take her stand in the evening after dusk close by the entrance to somerset house in the summer she would hold a few flowers in her hand in the winter laces and bobbins and her invariable cry was oh pray dear sir or dear lady as the case might be pray do assist me i have only this moment come out of the hospital and have nowhere to sleep by these means she realized her five shillings in three or four hours and hastened back to castle street to spend them with a worthless fellow her paramour another individual whom we must mention was an elderly man who in his youth had been apprenticed to a chemist he obtained his living by displaying a fearfully ulcerated arm having himself originally produced the sores by means of corrosive acids and by the juices of various plants such as the ranunculus acris and scleratus the sponge laurel euphorbium arum maculatum etc he regularly revived and aggravated the ulcers every time they began to heal and his arm was really shocking to contemplate 
he would take his stand before a window and raising his shirt-sleeve display the ulcers so that the ladies or gentlemen at the casement sent him out a sixpence or a shilling as much for the purpose of getting rid of so loathsome a spectacle as through motives of charity it was this man's boast that three hours in a fashionable street or square would produce him seven or eight shillings another impostor present on this occasion was a man of about forty who was a perfect adept in disguising his person and who feigned a different malady for every change in his attire and outward appearance at one time he was suffering from ophthalmia produced by the application of irritants such as snuff pepper tobacco blue vitriol salt alum etc at another he would actually produce blindness for a time by the application of belladonna henbane or sponge laurel and then he was led about by a little boy again he would appear as a miserable creature afflicted with a horrible jaundice the yellow colour being produced by a dye he was also perfect in the counterfeit of spasmodic complaints paralysis and convulsions his earnings were usually considerable but on one occasion when things were very bad he obtained admission into a hospital as an epileptic patient and so well did he assume the dreadful attacks at particular intervals that he remained in the institution for several weeks lying on one of the beds in a filthy state of intoxication was a miserable object who was accustomed to go about the streets on his hands and knees holding iron grapnels his spine was bent upwards rounded like that of a cat in a passion and his legs were moreover deformed his supine position was no count of it he could not walk on his feet like other human beings thus far he certainly was an object of compassion but in his character he was a worthless fellow abusive insolent drunken and addicted to thieving sitting on another bed and so far gone in liquor that he could scarcely hold the pipe he was smoking sat a man about forty years of age named barlow he had been a clergyman and was now a begging letter impostor he possessed an excellent address and was most plausible in his speech as he was fluent with his pen but the moment he obtained any money he was never sober until it was spent he had travelled all over england knew every nobleman's or gentleman's country seat and had carried on an excellent business by means of his begging letters a labouring man his wife and daughter were amongst this precious company the girl was about fifteen and tolerably good-looking the family had been three days in that lodging-house and she already laughed at the obscene jest and applauded the licentious song two or three hawkers a couple of juvenile thieves and some young girls confirmed prostitutes made up the amount of the precious company into whose presence mutton-faced sal had conducted old death those who were acquainted with him saluted him respectfully for he was a great man a very great man amongst persons of a particular class who is that horrible old wretch asked the labourer's daughter in a whisper to jane cummins the richest fence in london returned the other in the same low tone of voice and what's a fence miss a fence you fool is a buyer of stolen goods as the beaks call it that old covey is rolling in riches shabby and mean as you see him he has been at it they tell me upwards of thirty years and has never got his self lumbered yet but the best of it is no one knows where his stores are no one even knows where he lives he has certain houses of call but the cunningest bow street officer can't find out his abode what do you mean by lumbered asked the girl whose name was matilda put into quod to be sure but how green you are we must teach you what's what i see that here help me to put on my gown it's mended now thank ye now come with me to the window and i'll tell you what a happy kind of life i lead and how you may do the same if you like but even as she uttered these words jane cummins heaved a sigh although she strove hard to subdue it the girl walked aside with her and they continued their conversation in whispers at the window i'm afraid our till the old get no good here said the labourer in a low tone to his wife as he glanced uneasily towards his daughter nonsense you fool returned the woman 
you can't get no work and we must starve if we don't do something our gal can keep us if she will and she must too sooner or later it will come to that with her and as well now as ever the poor labourer sighed he would have remained honest and kept his wife and daughter so if he could but want and houseless wanderings in the cold street stared him in the face and he resigned himself to the bitter destiny that was thus forced upon him and his family in the meantime old death had taken a seat near the fire and was deep in a whispered conversation with mutton-faced sal where's josh pedlar he asked he'll be in shortly was the answer he's only gone out to fetch something for his supper and so tim the snammer is lumbered said old death yes he's in clerkenwell but you'll get him off when he goes up again afore the beak on saturday won't you old chap now won't you i don't know i don't know he isn't one of my men he never would give me a turn his name doesn't appear against a number on my list but he will give you all his business in future if you'll get him off this time just this time said the girl coaxingly we shall see what josh has to tell me i never promise in a hurry returned old death besides it's not the rule to assist a man that goes to others to do his business tim gets his notes changed at old isaac's or at milbury's or at mrs davis's or at rayner's or and as old death enumerated his competitors telling them off on his fingers slowly one after the other his jealousy arose to such a pitch that the workings of his countenance became absolutely frightful now what's the use of going on like this said sal i tell you that tim shan't have no more to do with them people if you'll only get him off this time none of them can do it as sure as you and if you only tell me it shall be done why it's as good as done at this moment the door opened and a tall rather good-looking but rakish and shabbily dressed man of about five-and-twenty made his appearance here's josh cried the girl the thief and old death exchanged greetings and the latter proposed to adjourn to a public-house in the neighbourhood to talk over the business thither the two men accompanied by mutton-faced sal accordingly repaired and bones suffered himself to be persuaded to receive the three five-pound notes and the sovereign mentioned in the flash letter as the price of his endeavours to procure the discharge of tim the snammer the old man then took his departure and josh pedlar returned with sal to the lodging-house End of section 24section 25 of the mysteries of london volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the mysteries of london volume 3 by george w m reynolds chapter 25 matilda the country girl in the meantime jane cummins had been using all her eloquence for the purpose of inducing matilda briggs the poor labourer's daughter to become as bad as herself you don't know what a pleasant life we lead she repeated when she had drawn the girl aside to the window quinn my man earns lots of money and we know how to spend it to-night we'd a roast loin of pork and apple sauce for supper at a slap-up eating-house then we'd some rum and water and then we came home here look how quinn's enjoying himself with that egg hot isn't he a capital fellow to be able to get so much money and all so easy too and don't you think i'm happy to have nothing to do but to help him spend it again the young woman struggled fruitlessly to keep down a sigh for in reality she loathed she abhorred the life which she was leading and what do you suppose will become of you and your father and mother she continued why if it wasn't for that good-natured fellow josh pedlar you'd have all been turned out last night into the streets and when the woman came in just now to collect the three pences didn't he take and pay for you and the old people and didn't he give you all the grub you had to-day 
why do you speak so much about him asked the country girl oh i don't know only because he seems to have taken a fancy to you returned jane cummins and i tell you what it is you may become his joman if you like his what said matilda blushing for she half understood the meaning of the word why his wife over the left if you choose was the answer but what a fool you are you're not so innocent as you pretend to be come tell me have you ever had a lover never replied the girl then it's high time you should the truth is josh told me to sound you she added in a mysterious manner and if you only say the word we'll have a wedding here to-night josh has got plenty of money at this moment he found a purse the day before yesterday where inquired the country girl in a gentleman's pocket at the theatre returned jane coolly and he talks of setting up a mint a mint what with asked matilda with queen's medal to be sure responded the other and i think he's a very thriving young fellow you'd be as happy as a princess along with him and wouldn't he come out strong to-night with the lush if you was to say yes but my father my mother murmured the girl hesitatingly oh leave them to me said jane cummins go and sit down again i'll manage the old woman and she can manage the old man herself matilda returned to her seat and quinn who could pretty well guess what his mistress had been about handed the country girl the quart pot of egg flip she declined to partake of it but he pressed her hard and she drank a few drops oh that's nothing a mere taste cried quinn take another sip come and she did as she was desired lord bless the girl she's quite afraid of it said quinn but you must and shall have a good draught resistance was vain quinn held the pewter pot to her lips and forced her to imbibe a considerable quantity he then passed the measure to her mother who did not require any entreaty to drink and the labourer himself was not one likely to refuse good liquor when it was offered to him quinn thus got upon very pleasant terms with the poor family and making briggs sit next to him he began to chatter away in a familiar style not forgetting to hand round the quart pot at short intervals meantime jane cummins had drawn mrs briggs aside and made certain representations to her the result of which was that matilda should that very night become the mistress of josh pedlar the arrangement was however to be kept quiet until josh should return for fear that he might have altered his mind since he spoke to jane on the subject in the morning at length pedlar came back accompanied by mutton-faced sal and as he entered the room he exclaimed well pals it's all right old death has took it in hand and so tim is as good as out i've ordered round a gallon of gin punch to make merry in consequence this announcement was received with loud cheers come you here josh cried jane cummins i want to say a word to you well what is it demanded the thief oh nothing bad she replied with a significant look at her paramour quinn who laughed heartily as if an excellent piece of fun were in preparation jane then whispered a few words in josh pedlar's ears the man did not however wait to hear all she had to say but bursting away from her caught matilda briggs in his arms and giving her three or four hearty smacks with his lips shouted a wedding pals a wedding a wedding repeated those who were only now let into the meaning of all the mysterious whispering that had been going on first between jane and matilda then between jane and mrs briggs afterwards between mrs briggs and her husband and lastly between jane and josh pedlar a wedding they cried hooray yes a wedding in right good earnest exclaimed josh but where's that drunken old file barlow he's fallen asleep on his bed observed mutton-faced sal then rouse him and be damned to him cried pedlar sal approached the bed and speedily awoke the parson who was at first mighty wroth at what he considered to be a very 
great liberty but when he was informed that his services were required to perform a matrimonial ceremony that he was to have five shillings for the job and that a gallon of gin punch was expected immediately he uttered a tremendous oath by way of expressing his joy and leaped up with as much alacrity as the fumes of liquor which still influenced his brain would permit him to display a circle was then formed in the midst of which josh pedlar matilda briggs and the begging letter impostor parson took their station one of the hawkers produced a common brass ring which he handed to barlow over whose person quin threw a sheet by way of surplice while another individual gave him an obscene book the greatest excitement now prevailed amongst the rogues and loose women present and even matilda herself entered into the spirit of the proceeding for she was excited with the liquor which quin had forced upon her her poor father alone experienced a qualm of conscience but he dared not utter a word calculated to betray his scruples or manifest his regrets for his wife of whom he stood in dread cordially approved of the arrangement the drunken parson now commenced the ceremony and assuming as well as he could the seriousness of former days he recited the following slang chant i parish prig and bouncing ben do hear within this padding ken josh pedlar if thou wilt agree cop that young shaler unto thee to her a fancy bloke be thou tip molly's she's thy joman now barlow made the bride and bridegroom join hands and then continued thus when thou art out upon the cross may she be faithful to thy doss if things go rough and traps are nigh may she upon the nose be fly the company then repeated in chorus the last line after which display of their vocal powers their ceremony was continued by the parson in the following words if jude should pinch a lob or plan a sneezer or a randall's man or work the bulls and cooters rum or go the jump and spiel the drum or turn shop bouncer at a pinch should you do this and get the clinch may she while thou art lumbered be still true and faithful josh to thee the parson paused for a few moments and concluded with this distich be witness all to what is said and with this fawny ye are wed barlow handed josh the ring which the thief placed on the girl's finger and then gave her a hearty kiss the spectators immediately set up a shout of acclamation and at that instant the gin punch made its appearance a scene of debauchery noise quarrelling and ribaldry now followed the parson was voted into the chair which was constituted by the foot of one of the beds and the punch went rapidly round in pewter pots the bowl was soon emptied whereupon josh pedlar sent to the public-house and ordered another the little deformity without legs sang a filthy song even the man with the curved spine and who went about on grapnels forgot his wonted ill-humour and insolence and joined in the mirth the woman who had charge of the house was summoned and for a consideration of seven shillings and sixpence she agreed to provide a separate room for the accommodation of the happy couple this amount was duly paid and the woman was made drunk into the bargain for her trouble at length some one proposed a dance to which the parson objected and moved another bowl of punch as an amendment jane cummins however put an end to the argument by undressing herself and performing sundry saltatory evolutions in a complete state of nudity an example which was very speedily followed by mutton-faced sal whose grief for the loss of her paramour tim the snammer was temporarily drowned in punch even the woman in widow's weeds was about to adopt the same course but she was too tipsy to accomplish her purpose and on rising from her chair fell on one of the beds and into a profound sleep at the same time the noise confusion and disgusting licentiousness of the scene increased to an extraordinary degree but josh pedlar led matilda away or rather carried her for the unfortunate girl was now in a complete state of intoxication 
revolting as the contemplation of such a scene as that just described must be to the rightly constituted mind it was nevertheless requisite to introduce it into such a work as the present its details prove how necessary it is to establish in the great metropolis cheap and well-conducted lodging-houses for the use of poor but honest families this cannot be done by private speculators because an efficient management can only be secured by legislative enactment the government then should direct its attention to this very important subject a poor man is compelled to quit his native town or village in the provinces and comes to london to seek for work he is accompanied by his wife and daughter penury compels him to fix upon the cheapest lodging he can find and a cheap lodging-house cannot be a respectable one its landlord and landlady have neither the time nor the means even if they possess the inclination to discriminate between the various applicants for admission on the contrary they are well aware that the worst characters are most likely to prove their best customers their only consideration is to make their establishment answer and so long as their lodgers pay for the accommodation they seek no questions can be asked to such a den therefore is the poor man forced to take his wife and his daughter the obscene language which falls upon this young girl's ears the fact of being compelled to lay aside her garments in the presence of several males who unconcernedly undress themselves before her the debauchery of the day the licentiousness of the night to all these elements of ruin is she immediately exposed a veil drops suddenly as it were from before her eyes and she finds herself hemmed in by moral corruption surrounded by temptation excited by new desires and encouraged to go astray by her companions how can she leave that sink of impurity otherwise than impure how can she quit that abode of infamy otherwise than infamous many a high-born lady has succumbed to the seducer under circumstances less venial under influences admitting a far less amount of extenuation were the government with the consent of the legislature to establish lodging-houses for poor but honest persons an immense benefit would be conferred upon that class and the fearful progress of immorality would receive a check at least in one point the respectability of such institutions might be insured by placing trustworthy married couples at their head and applying a system of rules which would enforce regular hours exclude ardent spirits and only permit a moderate quantity of beer to be brought in for the use of each individual and likewise empower magistrates to punish those who might be brought before them charged with breaking the regulations or otherwise subverting the wholesome discipline enjoined thieves prostitutes and bad characters would not attempt to obtain admission to establishments of this description no more than a person enjoying a competency would endeavour to become the inmate of a workhouse scenes of debauchery and unbounded license alone suit abandoned males and females and thus every guarantee would exist for the respectable management of those institutions which would save the honest poor from the low lodging-houses of london end of section twenty five section twenty six of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter twenty six the lady's maid in the meantime mr frank curtis had met the buxom charlotte according to appointment in conduit street the youthful lady's maid who had not numbered quite nineteen years but who concealed a warm temperament and a disposition ripe for wanton mischief beneath a staid and serious demeanour when in the presence of her mistress or of those in whose eyes it was prudent to be looked upon as a very prudent and steady young woman 
the youthful lady's maid we say walked quietly along the street and pretended not to notice mr curtis who was leaning against the lamp-post smoking a cigar but the light of the lamp fell upon her pretty countenance and he having immediately recognized her stretched out his hand and caught her by the shawl saying well miss do you mean to pretend you didn't see me lor you there now exclaimed charlotte affecting to be quite surprised at this encounter just as if you thought i shouldn't come cried frank laughing but take my arm my dear and though this very arm has often supported duchesses and marchionesses and even on one occasion the young and beautiful queen of the red-skin indians yet i don't know that it was ever more agreeably pressed than by your pretty little fingers how fine you do talk said charlotte by no means displeased with the compliment but where are you going oh i'll show you my dear returned frank as he led her along and now tell me has anything happened in respect to you know what yes a great deal answered charlotte but here i am walking with a gentleman whose very name i don't even know isn't it odd very my dear i will however soon satisfy you on that head my name is mr curtis to the world but frank to you and some day or another i hope to be baron dumplington but what was it that you had to tell me something about miss mordaunt replied the girl who firmly believed the dumplington story and entertained a proportionate amount of respect towards the young gentleman who was heir to so honourable and distinguished a title come out with it my dear exclaimed frank business first and love afterwards as my dear lamented friend the prince of cochin china used to say when we were intimate together in paris before he hung himself for love in his garters did he though cried the lady's maid how shocking shocking enough my dear but pray tell me what you have to say about miss mordaunt why sir resumed charlotte this evening when i was dressing her for dinner she began to sound me about how i liked my place in lady hatfield's service and whether i should be glad to better myself so keeping in mind what you had told me to do i seemed to fall in to all she asked me and gave her to understand that i shouldn't object to better myself then she began to simper and smile and at last let out plump that she was going to run away with a gentleman but she didn't say who to-morrow night that gentleman my dear is an uncle of mine said curtis i'll be bound then it's the same sir christopher blunt the very same my dear but go on you speak almost as well as i did when i was in parliament or as my uncle the earl of dumplington do i the well continued charlotte and so miss mordaunt told me how she couldn't think of travelling alone with the gentleman and that she must have a lady's maid and you agreed to go with her cried frank i did answered charlotte and we settled and arranged everything quite comfortable did she tell you where she is to meet my uncle to-morrow night inquired frank no but she told me to mind and be ready to leave in the evening at about seven o'clock returned charlotte well fortunately i do know where they are to meet and that's close by the turnpike at islington green said frank she's to go up in a hackney coach and be there punctual at eight o'clock and the old chap is to have the post chaise and four in readiness doesn't he already fancy himself tearing along the great north road as if the devil was after him and so nice too did he arrange his plans with his julia that there's to be a supper prepared for them at st albans and off again egad he's settled it pleasant enough but i'll be even with him what do you intend to do asked charlotte 
curtis did not immediately reply but after a few moments consideration he abruptly exclaimed can you trust any female friend of yours in this business well i don't know unless it is my own sister alice which is a very nice girl and will do anything i tell her was the reply the very thing ejaculated frank is she out at service no she's at home with mother answered charlotte and will she just consent to take a short ride in a post-chaise and four along with you if i give her a five-pound note demanded frank to be sure she will returned charlotte who with the quickness of female perception began to comprehend mr curtis's design then i'll tell you how we must contrive it said frank it's of the greatest consequence to me my dear to prevent this marriage and if i can only expose my stupid old uncle i shall fairly laugh him out of it now don't you think you could manage to pass yourself off as his julia and get your sister to play the part of yourself as far as st albans and i would be there with three or four friends of mine all jolly dogs ready to receive sir christopher and you girls you might cover your face well with a thick veil and as he will be sure to hurry you into the post-chaise the moment you get down from the hackney coach just beyond the turnpike on the green you needn't speak a word then you can pretend to be so overcome with fear and anxiety oh leave all that to me exclaimed charlotte who relished the joke amazingly but what shall i do about my place at lady hatfield's deuce take your place my dear cried frank i'll secure beautiful lodgings for you in some nice quiet retired street at the west inn and you shall be as happy as the days long we'll have such fun together and i'll take you to plays and all kinds of amusements lord bless you i think no more of a cool thousand or two than i should of blowing out a chap's brains if he was to insult you oh dear me don't talk so horrid exclaimed charlotte laughing and you really will do all you say if i help you in this business yes and much more returned frank and now the only thing to manage is to prevent miss mordaunt keeping the appointment by herself oh i have it he exclaimed after a minute's reflection i can imitate my uncle's handwriting to a t he writes just as if he had a skewer instead of a pen and so do i for that matter so i'll just tip miss julia a note to-morrow afternoon about four as if it came from sir christopher and i'll tell her in it that the elopement must be postponed until the next night egad this is a stroke of policy that beats hollow anything my cousin the duke of dumplington ever did i thought he was your uncle sir remarked charlotte i meant my uncle love replied frank but it's all the same the marquis of dumplington is my relation and that's enough and now my sweet creature that we have settled all this business suppose we adjourn to a nice quiet place that i know but i must see my sister to-night and tell her all that there is to be done interrupted charlotte the fact is that the pretty lady's maid had kept the appointment given her by frank curtis with the full intention of abandoning her person to him for she was alike wanton in her passions and mercenary in her disposition and the five guineas which he had given her in the morning had stimulated her with the desire of making farther inroads upon his purse nay she had even hoped that he would fulfil the sort of promise he had given her at their previous interview and in plain terms establish her as his mistress in a comfortable manner 
but the intrigue just concocted for the purpose of defeating the matrimonial design of miss mordaunt and sir christopher blunt had engendered new ideas in the breast of the lady's maid and she resolved that her intimacy with mr curtis should progress no farther for the present the young man who at this moment cared much more for the success of his scheme against his uncle than for the attractions of miss charlotte styles willingly allowed her to repair at once to the abode of her mother for the purpose of tutoring alice how to play the part which that younger sister was to enact in the great drama planned by mr curtis charlotte accordingly separated from frank with a promise to write to him if anything should go wrong but with an understanding on the other hand that her silence was to be construed by him into a proof that all was progressing favourably to his views End of section twenty six section twenty seven of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter twenty seven london on a rainy evening a scene in a post chaise london has a strange appearance on those evenings so peculiar to our climate when a cold drizzling mist-like rain is falling the lustre of the gas-lights in the shops is seen dimly as if through a gauze and the lamps in the streets have an air as though they struggle to preserve themselves from total extinction clogs and pattens create a confused rattling on the pavement and to a bird's eye view such crowded thoroughfares as cheapside fleet street the strand and holborn must appear to have their toitoires arched with umbrellas then aristocracy seemed to urge the horses of its carriage more quickly on as it whisks to the club the parliament or the dinner-party the member of the middle class buttons his taglioni or his greatcoat over his chest the individual of a humbler sphere tries to make his scanty tweed cover as much of his person as it will and poverty wraps its rags around its shaking limbs apparently forgetful that in drawing them over one place they leave another bare in the entrances of courts and covered alleys and in deep doorways the daughters of pleasure oh the frightful misnomer collect and huddle together in their flaunting attire the pattering of the rain rendering their poor thin shoes as pulpy as brown paper and splashing over their stockings and thus aiding ardent spirits and nights of dissipation to plant the seeds of consumption more deeply in their constitutions the drivers of cabs and omnibuses thrust their heads as far into their hats or else push their hats as far down on their heads as possible and shrugging up their shoulders sit with rounded backs and faces bent downward on their vehicles while the conductors or omnibus cads in their oilskin coats seem to find consolation for the unpleasantness of the weather in the fact that they can speedily fill their vehicles without the usual exercise of the lungs or gymnastic movements of the arm and on a rainy evening such as we are attempting to describe what business what bustle prevail in front of the angel inn at islington omnibus after omnibus comes up from every direction discharging and receiving their animated freight with wonderful rapidity 
the red-nosed man at the booking-office seems to have something better to do than merely lounge at the threshold with his right shoulder leaning against the door-post off which it has worn the paint in one particular spot for inquiries now multiply thickly upon him indeed we are afraid that that last share of a quartern and two outs which he took with the elephant and castle six o'clock cad has somewhat obfuscated his ideas for he thrusts an elderly lady with a bandbox into a chelsea although she particularly requested to be placed in a bank omnibus and he has sent that tall lady with her three children and a baby over to kennington in spite of her thrice repeated anxiety to repair to sloane square what a paddling and stamping of feet and pattering of clogs and collision of umbrellas there are in every direction up the new road and down the city road along st john street and goswell street road and also up towards the green the most addle-pated rider may find some food for his pen if he only take his stand at the angel door with a cigar in his mouth too if he like on a rainy evening does he wish to see how a party of pleasure may be spoiled by a change in the weather let him study that little procession of a family who have passed the day at copenhagen house and are now returning home wet cold uncomfortable and sulky the husband dragging the chaise in which two children are squalling a lubberly boy of eight or nine pushing behind and the wife with a baby on one arm and holding up her gown with the left hand paddling miserably through the rain and venting her ill-humour on her husband by declaring that it was all his fault she knew how it would be she had begged and prayed of him to come home an hour before but he would stay to have that other glass of gin and water if our moralist whom we station at the door of the angel be an admirer of pretty feet and ankles he may now gratify his taste in that respect for of a surety those who have good ones raise their dresses above the swell of the leg ah ladies it is really too bad of you we almost suspect that you care little for the rain since it enables you to display those attractions the policeman with his oil-skin cape emerges from the public-house close by drawing the back of his hand across his lips just for all the world as if he had been taking something short to keep the cold out and very likely he has too for we are sure that the most rigid disciplinarian of an inspector or sergeant would not quarrel with him for so doing on such an unpleasant evening the apple-stall woman puts up an umbrella and maintains her seat on the low basket turned bottom upwards for she dares not absent herself from her post for fear of the hungry urchins that are prowling about within the doorway of the angel a knot of young gentlemen in pea-coats and with sticks in their hands are smoking cigars they are not waiting for the omnibuses but are merely collected there because the bustle of the scene amuses them and they like to look at the gals listen a moment to their conversation they are talking about some favourite actress at an adjacent theatre and to hear their astute observations one would think that they must at least be the dramatic critics of the newspapers assembled there or else perhaps their discourse turns on politics and then one would be apt to imagine that they were under secretaries of state in disguise so profound are their remarks they call the minister of the day by his surname without any titular adjunct and one of them no doubt wiser than the rest shakes his head solemnly and very kindly prophesies the said minister's approaching downfall then the conversation flies off at a tangent to some less important subject and they most probably proceed to comment upon the excellent lark they had the other night at such and such a place presently one of them proposes a 
go of whisky each and they accordingly adjourned to the public room of the angel where what with the goes of whisky and the going of their tongues they create so much noise that the old gentleman at the next table flings down the last sunday's paper in despair before he has read through the third murder well reader it was on such a rainy evening as this that two grand events in our history were to take place we mean the affair of sir christopher blunt on the one hand and the project of old death to kidnap charlie watts on the other it is our intention however to proceed with the former little business in this chapter at a quarter to eight o'clock a post-chaise and four passed through the turnpike at islington and drew up in the lower road alongside the enclosure of the green the right-hand window was then lowered and a head enveloped in a fur travelling cap with lappets over the ears and tying under the chin was protruded forth this head which belonged to sir christopher blunt looked anxiously up and down the thoroughfare and was then withdrawn again but the worthy knight's patience was not tested to any great extent for in a few minutes after his arrival at the appointed spot and before the clock had struck eight a hackney coach rattled up to the place where the chaise was waiting sir christopher threw open the door of the chaise kicked down the steps and leaped out with the agility of a small elephant and in a few moments he very gallantly handed two females well muffled up in cloaks boas and veils from the hackney coach dearest julia he murmured to the taller of the two as he assisted her to ascend into the post-chaise an expressive squeeze of the hand was the reply to this affectionate apostrophe on the part of the knight the shorter female whom sir christopher concluded to be his fair one's attendant inasmuch as miss mordaunt had informed him by note in the morning that she had secured a faithful maid to accompany her was also handed into the post-chaise the knight followed and the vehicle hurried away like wildfire sir christopher and the female whom he believed to be miss mordaunt sat on the back seat and the other young lady occupied the seat facing them for some time there was a dead silence inside the chaise but at the expiration of about ten minutes sir christopher began to fidget like a gentleman at a public dinner who though unaccustomed to public speaking nevertheless experiences a nervous anxiety to address the audience my dear julia <clears throat> began the knight i hope you you don't feel cold dear the female thus addressed threw her arms round sir christopher's neck and clasped him so fondly that what with the tightness of the embrace and the contact of the fur in which she was enveloped he might have been pardoned had he fancied for a moment that he was being hugged by a bear oh dearest julia how happy i am exclaimed sir christopher nearly suffocated by this display of fondness and you julia are you happy my love quite too happy murmured his companion and yet methinks your voice sounds strange julia said the knight what what is the matter with you only this sir christopher that i am not miss mordaunt not miss mordaunt ejaculated the knight preparing to throw down the window and order the postilions to stop no not miss mordaunt was the answer but one who loves you as well or better and is i flatter myself six times as good-looking then who are you in the name of heaven cried the knight so completely bewildered that he knew not how to act charlotte for it was she threw back her veil and by the light of the shops which they were just passing in the outskirts sir christopher recognized lady hatfield's dependent whom he had seen on two or three occasions when he had called on miss mordaunt in piccadilly 
and who is your companion he demanded hastily my sister alice at your service replied charlotte but listen to me for one moment sir christopher well for one moment then said the knight so strangely perplexed and annoyed that he could take no decisive step miss mordaunt never loved you sir christopher continued the wily charlotte never loved me then why did she tell me so only to laugh at you it was all planned between her and your nephew mr frank curtis the devil ejaculated the knight go on they determined to make themselves merry at your expense and yourself ridiculous at the same time by heaven i will be revenged cried the hero of this pleasant adventure slapping his thigh emphatically with his open palm they accordingly hired me and my sister to personate miss mordaunt and a lady's maid proceeded charlotte and we were to carry on the deceit till we got to st albans where mr frank curtis and a party of his friends are already waiting to receive you the villain shouted sir christopher completely deceived by this plausible tale but i always admired you sir continued charlotte and i was resolved not to be made a party to carry out the trick to the end i should have written to you or called to explain it but i feared you might not believe me and so i thought it best to let matters go as far as they have gone now just to convince you that what i say is perfectly true oh i believe it all it is too clear too apparent exclaimed the knight that scoundrel frank i'll discard him i'll stop his allowance i'll never speak to him again to get a party of friends to meet us at st albans eh just where i'd sent word to have a good supper in readiness miss mordaunt told him all that sir observed charlotte who had kept one of her arms round the knight's neck and had gradually approached her countenance so closely to his that her breath now fanned his cheek yes i understand it all cried sir christopher i have been grossly deceived vilely treated basely served but i am not the man to put up with it at the same time miss he added in a softening tone you are a very good girl to have saved me from cutting so ridiculous a figure at st albans i have only done my duty sir murmured charlotte with a profound sigh and of course by accident her cheek touched that of the knight a good girl a very good girl repeated sir christopher as good as you are pretty for you are pretty and i've often remarked it the arm thrown around sir christopher's neck pressed him gently and i really do not know how to reward you sufficiently my dear girl he added new ideas entering his mind again the arm pressed him tenderly sir christopher could resist the exciting contiguity no longer and he fairly kissed the cheek that was so close to his lips charlotte sighed again but did not withdraw her face really this is very ridiculous exclaimed the knight here we are galloping along like lightning and without any particular object that i know of upon my word i have a great mind a very great mind to revenge myself on both miss mordaunt and master frank at one and the same time in what way sir christopher asked charlotte in a languidly murmuring tone by marrying you my dear was the emphatic response oh sir christopher is it possible such happiness sighed charlotte again embracing him in the most tender manner it is so possible my dear answered the knight that if you consent to have me the horses heads need not be turned back again towards london how can i refuse you dear sir christopher exclaimed charlotte i who always thought what a fine-looking handsome kind genteel fashionable man you was from the first time i ever saw you i'm sure i always heard sister speak in the highest terms of you sir said alice now taking up her cue 
well then my dear what is to hinder us from being happy cried sir christopher with these words he pulled down the window ordered the postilions to stop and gave them directions to change their route in such a manner as to avoid st albans the vehicle then whisked along with renewed speed and while sir christopher felt wonderfully elated at the idea of punishing his nephew and avenging himself on miss mordaunt by showing her that she was not the only female in the world to whom he was compelled to address himself charlotte on the other hand rejoiced at the success of a scheme which had been suggested by the part she was originally engaged to play in this pleasant drama and which as the reader will now perceive was the motive that prevented her from extending her intimacy with mr frank curtis on the previous evening end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds tom rain's lodgings in locksfield nearly opposite to the house where tom rain lived in brandon street locksfields there was a boozing ken well known to old death and shortly after nine o'clock on the same evening which marked the events related in the preceding chapter that cunning fence accompanied by toby bunce and the lad jacob were introduced by the landlord into a front room on the first floor of the said flash establishment jacob was ordered to station himself at the window and watch for tom rain to take his departure on the expedition devised for him by old death while bones himself and his acolyte toby seated themselves opposite a cheerful fire to discuss hot gin and water until the hour should arrive for putting into execution the scheme that had brought them thither although the rain was falling with a mist-like density and no gas company had been enterprising enough to lay down pipes in such a neighbourhood as locks fields so that there were neither stars nor lamps to light the street still the eagle eyes of jacob could distinguish sufficient of the scene without to quiet any fear lest the movements of tom rain should escape him old death moreover stimulated his energies by means of a sip of hot grog and the lad remained as motionless at the window and as earnestly intent on his object as a cat watching near the hole into which a mouse has escaped well said old death as he sipped his liquor complacently i suppose we shall have no difficulty in managing this little job by and by jacob watched all day long in great ormond street until we joined him to come over here and the jewess never stirred out once did she jacob no not once was the answer but you knew that she was at home yes because i saw her at the window for a moment every now and then replied the lad speaking without averting his eyes from the street good exclaimed old death it is not at all likely that she has come over to tom's lodgings this evening or that she will come especially after the long sermon she wrote bones checked himself for he was not in the habit of being communicative with toby bunce and toby on his side never sought to pry into the motives or designs of the old fence by whom he was made so complete a tool who was there in the house besides mr rainford and the boy asked toby after a pause only the old widow woman that keeps it responded mr benjamin bones there cried jacob suddenly the door opens and mr rainford comes out he's gone all right said old death i suppose he's going for his horse wherever he keeps it i could see by the light in the passage when the door was opened that he had his white coat on and his great riding whip in his hand remarked jacob it was a woman that held the candle because i could just catch a glimpse of her shadow and that's all you don't think it was the jewess asked bones i couldn't say because the shadow wasn't plain enough returned jacob 
but it's hardly probable that she could have got over here before us even if she was coming to mr rainford's lodgings to-night well said jacob observed old death you're getting a knowing lad you are and now you shall have a glass of grog to yourself what a whole glass ejaculated toby bunce in astonishment at this unwonted liberality on the part of old death yes a whole glass a sixpenny glass responded bones and having summoned the landlord he gave the requisite order the liquor was brought for jacob's express behoof and old death drew forth the money to pay for it but as he did so a paper with writing upon it fell upon the floor unperceived by any one save jacob the lad instantly drew a chair near the fire and as he seated himself placed his foot upon the paper which being somewhat dingy in hue he took to be a bank note the landlord withdrew and the conversation was resumed between old death and toby bunce i hope betsy will have something nice for supper when we get back again remarked the latter she's sure to do that replied old death you ought to be very fond of your wife toby for she's very fond of you do ye think she is mr bones exclaimed bunce i'm sure of it doesn't she take great care of you rather too much was the reply which came from the bottom of toby's heart then perceiving that he had uttered something which seemed to imply that he had dared to form an opinion for himself he hastened to add not but what's it's very kind of her to keep the money and my watch too and everything else in her own care because i know i'm an old fool no you're not an old fool toby interrupted bones but you want looking after ah it was a blessed day for you when i recommended you to marry that virtuous well-conducted pattern woman as one may say who is now your wife i had no interest but your good and hers i'm well aware of that mr bones cried toby and you've been an excellent friend to us i'm sure betsy respects you as if you was her toby was about to say father but he remembered that old death did not like to be reminded of his age and so he substituted brother well well said bones i've no doubt of what you tell me and so long as you're happy together that's everything toby smothered a sigh with a deep draught of gin and water old death poked the fire and jacob availed himself of the opportunity to stoop down and pick up the paper which he dexterously conveyed to his pocket unperceived by either of his companions but a sudden disappointment seized upon him for he could feel that it was too stiff for a bank-note and was moreover folded like a letter the time passed away and at length old death after consulting his watch declared it to be close upon eleven o'clock there were no lights visible in the house opposite and it was therefore determined to commence operations without farther delay before we leave here said old death remember what you are to do jacob and you toby will put on your masks rush in shut the door and make the old widow secure then you jacob will come out and fetch me it won't do for the woman to see me at all because i'm so tall that if she described me to tom rain when he comes back he would know who it was directly but as there's nothing particular about either of you he can't make you out from description we'll take care mr bunce how the thing is managed said toby the trio then quitted the public-house and while toby and jacob crossed to the other side of the street old death walked a little way on the coast was quite clear and a profound silence reigned throughout the neighbourhood toby bunce and the lad stopped at the door of the widow's house slipped on their black masks and knocked in a few moments the door was opened by the widow herself quick as lightning the candle was knocked from her hand and the scream that half burst from her lips was arrested by a large plaster which toby instantaneously clapped upon her mouth the poor woman fainted through excess of terror and was borne into the nearest room where jacob hastened to strike a light having succeeded thus far toby remained in charge of the landlady while jacob hastened to fetch old death in a few moments the lad returned with that individual and the front door was again carefully closed the widow continued in a swoon 
and toby did not give himself any trouble to recover her do you remain here said old death addressing himself to his myrmidon bunce and if the woman revives and attempts to struggle or any nonsense of that kind give her a knock on the head just to quiet her but no more all right returned toby rejoiced to find that he had only a female to deal with old death then took the light and followed by jacob cautiously ascended the stairs they entered the front room on the first floor it was a parlor very neatly furnished but no one was there the boy must be in the back chamber murmured old death and thither they proceeded having opened the door as noiselessly as possible they advanced slowly into the room but scarcely had the candle shed its light upon the bed when they beheld the boy the object of their enterprise cradled on the bare and beautifully modelled arm of a female also wrapped in slumber and whose coal-black hair spread itself over the white pillow and partially concealed her glowing bust the jewess whispered jacob in a rapid concentrated tone old death instantly shaded the light with his hand and retreated from the room followed by the lad but at that moment a loud knock at the front door was heard and simultaneously a piercing shriek burst from the apartment below where toby bunce had been left in charge of the landlady old death muttered a terrible curse extinguished the light and hastened downstairs as noiselessly as possible jacob following with equal caution the back way murmured old death but first go and help toby who was in some trouble or another with the landlady jacob darted into the front room and as it was quite dark he stumbled over a chair the struggle between toby and the landlady who had succeeded in getting off the plaster was now renewed and releasing her throat from the suffocating grasp which her assailant had upon it she screamed for help a second time the knocking at the front door was redoubled and in a few moments a light gleamed from the head of the stairs perdition murmured old death it is the jewess then rushing into the front room he exclaimed come off this moment and he was about to beat a retreat by the back way when the house door was forced in with a vigorous push what the devil is doing here cried the well-known voice of tom rain as he banged the door behind him and drew the bolt who was screaming what oh tom is that you exclaimed a melodious though excited voice on the stairs there are thieves murderers in the house and the half-naked lady with her coal-black hair floating around her shoulders and over her bosom suddenly appeared at the turning of the narrow staircase holding a candle the light illumined the small passage below and showed tom rain standing with his back against the front door and with a pistol in each hand a third scream burst from the parlor rainford rushed in and encountering toby and jacob dragged them or rather hurled them as if they were two children in his grasp into the passage there the light revealed to him their countenances for their masks had been torn away in the struggle with the landlady and rainford was for a few moments so astounded at the recognition of old death's agents or confederates that he was unable to utter a word the villains the murderers the assassins cried the landlady rushing forward with her hair all in disorder her garments torn to rags and the blood streaming from her nose shall i go and fetch a constable mr rainford no i thank ye returned tom leave me to manage these scoundrels here my love he continued addressing himself to the jewess who had remained half-way up the stairs give me that light and do you retire to your room i must speak to these rascals in private my good woman he added turning once more to the landlady have the kindness to go up stairs and keep my wife company and fear nothing now that i am here the two women hastened to obey these injunctions and rainford provided with the candle made an imperative sign for toby bunce and jacob to precede him into the room from which he had dragged them a few minutes previously answer me directly said tom in a stern resolute manner as he closed the door behind him and deliberately drew forth the pistols which he had thrust into the pockets of his white great coat when he first entered the parlor to rescue the landlady answer me directly either one of you i care not which what brought you here jacob knows best mr rainford replied bunce eyeing the pistols askance 
no i don't said the lad in a sulky tone you are game to your employer i have no doubt jacob ejaculated rainford and now toby bunce answer for yourself or by god i'll shoot you through the head in short what brought you here at this moment there was a low knock at the room door against which tom rain was leaning who's there demanded the highwayman me replied the sepulchral hollow voice of old death ah the plot thickens said tom and opening the door he gave admittance to mr benjamin bones it's all a mistake tom it's the wrong house exclaimed old death you don't know how annoyed i am you don't indeed well i confess i do not said the highwayman coolly and it will take you a long time to persuade me that you are speaking the truth if it was the wrong house why didn't these people of yours tell me so when i first questioned them because i saw you would not believe me cried jacob hastily and i was so flurried by them barkers added toby pointing to the pistols i'm not such a fool as you take me to be observed tom rain without being able to fathom your intentions i can smell treachery as easy as i could gunpowder how did you find out that i lived here you must have had me dogged and watched old death and perhaps the very job you sent me after to-night was a mere subterfuge to get me out of the way fortunately i did not wait for the yellow chase because i picked up something better the moment i reached black heath and i thought i had done quite enough for one evening's work so i returned without delay lucky it was that i did so but am i to have an explanation of this affair or do you mean us to break with each other for good and all what can i say what can i do to prove to you that this is all a mistake cried old death sadly perplexed between the fear of complete detection and the dread of losing the valuable services of the highwayman i will tell you answered tom after a few moments consideration let these two followers of yours go their ways and you and me will have a little discourse in private a sudden misgiving a horrible suspicion flashed to the mind of old death could rainford mean to murder him why do you hesitate demanded the highwayman penetrating his thoughts do you suppose for an instant that i intend you any harm why you miserable old wretch he added with a proud contempt which rendered him strikingly handsome for the moment i would sooner blow out my own brains than defile my hands by laying them violently on such a piece of withered carrion as you are unless you give me ample cause old death's lips quivered with rage but subduing his emotions as well as he was able he made a sign for toby bunce and jacob to depart this hint was obeyed and in a few moments bones was alone in the room with the highwayman what is it you require of me asked the old man in a tremulous voice for there was something in rainford's tone and gesture which alarmed him i will explain myself to you said tom when we first knew each other you boasted that all your transactions were conducted with so much caution that none with whom you had dealings even knew where you lived was it not so very likely very likely returned old death but what of that simply that as it suited you to keep your place of abode secret from me so did i wish that my residence should remain unknown to you answered rainford now mark me mr bones or whatever the devil your name may be you shall have no advantage over me hitherto our compact has been fairly kept but at length i find you practising falsely towards me you need not interrupt me with vows and protestations because i shall not believe you but i tell you what you will do and this night too what groaned old death you will place us on even ground you will give me the same advantage that you have gained over me in a word you will take me straight to the place where you live and you will show me your stores where you keep all the property you receive or purchase from those who are in league with you i-i have no stores said old death and as for my lodging i-i have no settled place i sleep sometimes in one crib sometimes in another all lies ejaculated tom in a determined tone 
you have enormous dealings with all the housebreakers and thieves in london you have said as much to me and you have boasted that they are ignorant of your residence now then you have a residence and i swear that before i am six hours older i will know so much about you that you shall never dare to practise any treachery towards me what treachery could i practise against you tom asked old death in a conciliatory tone i will tell you replied rainford you boast that for thirty years you have monopolized the business of fence to all the people worth dealing with in london and during that time you have never got into a scrape but how could you have enjoyed so wonderful a safety so uninterrupted a security unless you now and then sacrificed yes sacrificed an accomplice or two i ejaculated odette starting in spite of himself yes you rejoined rainford fixing his eyes sternly and searchingly on the ancient villain's hideous countenance do you think that i am unacquainted with your real character do you suppose that i was at a loss to understand you even the first moment we ever met that flippancy of manner that off-handedness that reckless indifference which characterize me are a species of mask from behind which i can penetrate into the deepest recesses of the hearts of others i know you as well as you know yourself or nearly so at all events i know enough to render me cautious and wary and by the living god you shall never have an opportunity of selling me to save yourself tom my dear tom exclaimed old death now actually frightened by the other's manner and astonished at his words you cannot think of such a thing seriously so seriously do i think of it replied rainford that i will drag you into the pit if i am destined to fall so now without another word prepare to reveal to me all the mysteries in which you have for thirty years enveloped yourself and if i refuse said old death doggedly rainford deliberately cocked his pistol you have inveigled me into a snare you have sent away those who might protect me and now you seek an excuse to murder me exclaimed old death his voice sounding like ringing metal did i not say ere now that i would not harm you unless you give me just cause demanded rainford and think you that your refusal to comply with my present wish does not constitute such just cause you have discovered my lodging which it does not suit me to leave on that account you may also have found out that i am not alone here i know that a certain jewess is your mistress said old death with a savage leer for all the vindictive passions of his nature were aroused by the conduct of the individual who dared to coerce him him who had never been coerced before a certain jewess repeated rainford surveying old death with a singular expression of countenance yes esther de medina added bones esther de medina is as pure and innocent as the babe that is unborn cried the highwayman with impassioned emphasis then she must be your wife said old death liar thundered tom rain rushing forward and seizing the ancient villain by the throat then as if ashamed of the sudden transport of rage into which he had suffered himself to be betrayed he withdrew his hand and said in a more quiet but still determined manner mention not the name of esther de medina with disrespect or i warn you that my vengeance yes my vengeance will be terrible and now prepare to lead me to your place of abode for i am wearied of this long parley he again drew forth one of his pistols which he had consigned to his pocket when he rushed on the old man in the way just described you'll repent this mr rainford said old death endeavouring to impress the highwayman with vague and undefined alarms you see how evil your nature is since you can threaten me thus cried tom but i care little for your menaces i have but two alternatives to choose between one is to blow your brains out at once the other is to get you as much into my power as you have got me into yours either way will answer my purpose so now make up your mind which it shall be the people in locks fields wouldn't take much notice if they heard a pistol fired and there's a pretty deep ditch at the bottom of the yard behind the house 
old death shuddered for there was something awfully determined in the highwayman's manner well and if i take you to a certain place he said how do i know that you will not split upon me trust to me as i shall then trust to you ejaculated rainford shall we not continue to be necessary to each other and on my part i shall at least experience more confidence since i shall know that you cannot ruin me without bringing destruction on yourself be it as you say growled old death and fixing his greasy cap upon his head he prepared to depart one moment while i say a word upstairs said rainford and hastily quitting the room he locked the door behind him scarcely a minute elapsed ere he returned to the great relief of the old man who had begun to entertain serious misgivings at being made a prisoner there are marks of dirty boots upon the carpet in the bedroom above said tom confronting bones and fixing upon him a searching look what were you doing there i was not there began old death quailing beneath that glance damnable liar cried rainford i have half a mind but no he added checking himself time will show what your purpose was in invading this house and i shall know how to punish any treachery on your part and now mark me you will lead the way and i shall follow you avoid great thoroughfares had we not better take a coach asked old death no we will walk be it to the other end of london replied the highwayman resolutely i shall follow close behind you beware how you attempt to address yourself to a soul whom you may meet beware also how you trifle with me but stay i will have a guarantee for your good faith give me your pocket-book my pocket-book ejaculated old death with something approaching a shudder yes your pocket-book replied rain i know that it contains bank-notes and memoranda of value or utility to you and i will retain it in this house until we return from the expedition on which we are about to set forth come quick i have no time for idle delays my pocket-book repeated old death with increasing dismay do i not speak plain enough demanded the highwayman if i cannot make myself intelligible by words i may by deeds so permit me to help myself to the article i require it will not be the first time i shall have rifled a pocket he added with a merry laugh do you know that you are treating me in a manner that i never experienced before said old death his hideous countenance convulsed with rage i can very well believe what you state returned tom rain coolly hitherto you have had to deal with men whom you got completely into your power whose lives hung on a thread which you could snap without endangering yourself who were mere puppets in your hands and did not dare say their names were their own oh i am well aware how you have played the tyrant the gripping avaricious grinding miser the cruel relentless despot but now now mr bones you have another sort of person to deal with a man who will be even with you anywhere and everywhere and who will never let you gain an advantage over him without acquiring one in return who are you demanded old death in strange bewilderment that talk to me thus why thomas rainford to be sure cried the highwayman laughing yet with a certain chuckling irony that sounded ominously on the old fence's ears and i need not tell you he continued after a few moments pause that i am rather a desperate character who would as soon shoot you in the open street ay or in the midst of a crowd too if you attempted any treachery towards me as i would ease a gentleman of his purse upon the lonely road but we are wasting time give me your pocket-book old death's courage had gradually oozed away during this strange colloquy and he now mechanically obeyed the command so imperiously addressed to him but suddenly recollecting himself as he was about to hand the pocket-book to the highwayman he said there is one letter here just one letter which i should like to keep about my own person well take that one letter returned tom and beware how you endeavour to secrete anything else old death's hand trembled as he unfastened the clasp of the greasy old pocket-book and when he had opened it he sighed deeply as his eyes alighted first on a roll of bank-notes then he turned the papers over 
one after another and clouds gathered thickly and more thickly upon his countenance this is strange very strange he muttered as he fumbled about with the letters and memoranda what is strange demanded rainford that i cannot find the letter i want returned old death with increasing agitation surely i cannot have lost it and yet i remember now i was referring to it this afternoon and oh yes i recollect i put it into my pocket but the search in his pockets was vain the letter was nowhere to be found come there's enough of delay and such like nonsense exclaimed the highwayman snatching the pocket-book from his hand again rainford quitted the room locking the door behind him and in a couple of minutes he returned saying your pocket-book is safe where no one will meddle with it till we come back it is now past eleven let us set off come you go first old death led the way and tom rain followed the latter conveying some pleasant intimidation as he closed the front door behind him about an ounce of lead in the other's back if he showed the slightest sign of treachery end of section twenty eight section thirty of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds the storerooms the reader has already seen and heard enough to be fully aware that thomas rainford was a man of undaunted courage nor did he now tremble when he found himself mured as it were in that subterranean along with a character so full of cunning and malignity as old death although completely ignorant of the dark and gloomy locality to which he had been brought and well aware that his companion was quite capable of the fullest treachery the highwayman followed the old fence with so firm a step and whistled away in a manner indicative of such utter recklessness of danger that his guide was himself astonished at so much daring but rainford was keenly observant of all the movements of his companion and resolutely as he walked he was nevertheless careful in following as precisely as possible in the steps of old death so that he might not be entrapped by any pitfall in that gloomy place on his part old death proceeded at a somewhat rapid pace shading the light with his hand so as to protect it from the strong current of air which rushed through the passage this passage or long subterranean vault was about ten feet wide and six high it was walled and arched with rough stone and paved with huge flags the masonry at the sides and overhead was green with the damp and even by the fitful light of the candle rainford could perceive that this strange place must have been in existence for many many years and here and there he observed little niches in the wall and in one there was the remnant of an image of the saviour on the cross it instantly flashed to the mind of the highwayman that this sinister-looking subterranean had once been connected with some monastic establishment and his imagination suggested that he was probably treading on the very place where the victims of ancient popish tyranny had been confined and left to perish through famine old death and tom rain had proceeded about sixty yards as well as the latter could guess along the vaulted passage when the former suddenly stopped and the highwayman perceived that their farther progress was barred by a huge door studded with iron knobs 
you are now about to enter my sanctuary, as I may call it, said Old Death, turning abruptly around on Rainford. And again, I ask you what guarantee I have that you will not betray me. The same security which I have that you will not prove treacherous to me, answered Tom. Old Death hesitated for a few moments, as if he were about to make another observation, but yielding to a second thought, which most probably showed him the inutility of farther remonstrance, he proceeded to unbar the massive door. It opened inwards, and led to a spiral flight of stone steps, up which the two men mounted, Rainford having previously secured the door, which had huge bolts on each side. Having ascended some forty steps, Old Death, who went first, placed the candle in a niche, and pushed up a trapdoor, which immediately admitted a strong current of air. But the precaution observed in respect to the light prevented it from being extinguished. I ought to have brought a lantern with me, by rights, murmured Old Death, but come along. You go on first, said Rainford, and I'll take care of the candle. No, give it to me, replied Bones hastily, and he extended his hand to grasp it. But Rainford hit him a hard blow on the wrist with the butt end of his pistol, and then seized the candle. What did you do that for? demanded Old Death savagely. Because I suspect you of treachery, returned the highwayman in a severe tone. But remember, I am well armed, and at the least appearance of evil intent on your part, I fire. You are wrong, Tom, my dear fellow, said Old Death coaxingly, as he still lingered at the top of the steps. Well, I may be, and I shall be glad to find that I am, exclaimed Tom, and now lead on. Old Death ascended the few remaining steps, and Rainford followed with his pistol in one hand and the candle in the other. They were now in a small room, furnished as a bedchamber, and when Old Death had let down the trap door again, he unrolled and spread a small carpet over it. This is your residence, said Rainford inquiringly. The old man nodded a grim assent. And your storerooms are in this house? For I can perfectly well understand that we have come into another house, and by the direction of the subterranean, I should say it must be in Red Lion Street. You know London well, said Old Death. I do, replied Rainford. Although you lived so long in the country, added Bones. Right again, old fellow, exclaimed Tom, and now for a farther insight into the mysteries of your abode. With these words, the highwayman approached a door on one side of the room, but Old Death, hastily advancing towards another door, said, This way, Tom, this way. There is nothing in that quarter worth seeing. But the ancient fence seemed agitated, and this was not lost upon his companion. Well, as you choose, observed the latter, resuming his careless off-hand manner, lead on. Bones had already opened the door, and he now conducted the highwayman into a spacious apartment, surrounded by shelves whereon were ranged an assortment of articles of the most miscellaneous description. Clothes and chinaware, candlesticks, plated and silver, all carefully wrapped up in paper, piles of silk pocket handkerchiefs, and heaps of linen garments, carpet bags and portmanteaus, every species of haberdashery, silk dresses and cotton gowns, velvet pelisses and shawls of all gradations of value, muffs, tippets and bows, ladies' shoes and gentlemen's boots, looking-glasses and candelabra, lamps and pictures, tea-urns and costly vases, meerschaum pipes and dressing-cases, 
immense quantities of cutlery, piles of printing paper, saddles and bridles, in short, an infinite variety of articles to detail which would occupy whole pages. Your magazine is crowded, old fellow, said Rainford, who, even while surveying the curious place in which he found himself, did not the less keep a strict watch upon his companion. Are you satisfied now? demanded Old Death. Not quite, answered Rainford. You must have another room where you keep your jewellery and all those kind of things. What kind of things? asked Bones sharply. Oh, things that require to be packed away with caution, to be sure, replied Tom Rain. For an instant, the old man cast upon him a glance of searching inquiry, as if to penetrate into the most sacred profundities of his soul. But the highwayman affected to be very intent in his contemplation of a picture, and the countenance of the fence grew more composed. Well, said Rainford, after a few moments' pause, there is no use in delaying the matter. I must and will make myself acquainted with every nook of this place. Old Death moved towards the door, facing the one by which they entered the apartment, and Rainford was conducted into a smaller room, but fitted up with shelves like the first. On those shelves were several boxes, of various dimensions and numerous jewel cases wrapped up in paper. Watches and plate, I suppose, said Rainford, pointing to the boxes. Something in that way, Tom, replied Old Death. Would you like to see any of them? No, thank you, was the answer. I am not particularly curious in that respect. Then as he appeared to glance casually round the room, his eyes dwelt for an instant upon an iron safe let into the wall. Well, have you seen enough? asked Old Death. It's getting very late. It must be early, you mean, replied the highwayman with a smile. But still there is time for the business that I have in hand, he added, his manner suddenly changing to seriousness. Old Death glanced towards him uneasily. Indeed, for some time, the fans had been suspecting that Rainford had an ulterior object in view, independent of the mere wish to become acquainted with his abode, and vague alarms now filled his mind. What could the highwayman mean? Was he other than he seemed? Did he intend to betray him? All these ideas rushed rapidly through the imagination of the horrible old man, and though he had formed a plan whereby to avenge himself on the only individual who had ever yet dared to coerce him, he trembled lest he should be unable to put it into execution. He knew that Rainford was a man of dauntless bravery, and believed him to be a desperate one, and now he found himself completely in this formidable person's power. Not that all death lacked courage himself, and he certainly was not deficient in treachery. But he wanted the strength, the physical strength, to maintain a deadly struggle with the highwayman, if it should come to that. Thus was it that for the first time, perhaps, the hardened miscreant trembled for his life. To throw open the window and call for assistance in case of danger, was to invite the entrance of persons who would discover all the mysteries of his abode, and death were an alternative scarcely more frightful. Yes, there is time enough for the business that I have on hand, repeated Rainford, his countenance assuming so stern, so determined an expression that old death trembled with a colder shudder than before. What do you mean? What is that, that, stammered old death? Sit down there, on that seat, thundered the highwayman, pointing imperiously to a chair. Sit down, I say, or by heaven, this pistol. Well, I will, I will, Tom, 
said Bones, perceiving the deadly weapon levelled point blank at his heart, and he sank into the chair accordingly. But do tell me if I have offended you, if... Hold your tongue, ejaculated Rainford, in so authoritative a manner that the ancient villain's powers of utterance were suddenly paralysed. And now mark me, continued the highwayman, I have a certain task to perform, which nothing save a superior physical strength on your part can prevent. But in the first place, it's necessary that I should bind you, that I should render you incapable of molesting me. Old Death was unable to reply, but he stared with vacant terror on the individual, whose proceedings were alike so mysterious and so alarming. Rainford took a coil of rope from a bale of goods that stood upon the table, and with extraordinary rapidity proceeded to fasten all Death's arms and legs to the chair, uttering terrible menaces the whole time that this oppression lasted, while the appalling state of the aged fancy's mind was indicated only by low moans and convulsive movements of uneasiness. Having made fast the end of the rope to the iron bars of the fireplace in such a manner that all death could not shift the chair beyond the length of the tether thus formed, Rainford leaned himself against the table and proceeded to address his prisoner. End of section 30